first question, question ID is 1453. Which of the following plants has combination of these plant traits? Sporophyte is dominant in the life cycle. It has vascular tissue and seeds are absent. Now mosses are bryophytes. Ferns are pteridophytes. Cycads are gymnosperms. And monopods are angiosperms. Gymnosperms are angiosperms. They have seeds. Seeds are present. Three options to color the right. Mosses. Mosses may the dominant life cycle phase is gametophyte. My first question is ferns. Ferns is the correct answer. Ferns may be not raised present here. Sporophyte dominant life cycle phase here. Vascular tissue here present. And third, relaxants. So the correct answer here is four. Next question is question one double four zero. Which of the following factors is known to be involved in postponing programmed cell death? In the allurone layer of cereals until endosperm mobilization is complete. Now, here we are talking about monopod seeds. There are three different development phases in uh, seeds of cereals. First development, uh, first phase is the development phase of the seeds. Next phase is the crescent phase. And last phase is the germination phase. Now, in all these phases, growth and differentiation of new tissues, as well as we can see disappearance of cells. Now this disappearance of cells in some tissues, this takes place by programmed cell death. Now, uh, this diagram, it indicates which tissues disappear at what stage of maturity or what stage of development. Now, the first tissue to disappear are the synergic or the antipodal cells, then comes the nucleus, and the perica, then starchy endosperm. After that, uh, in the germination phase, during the germination phase, after the development has been completed, during the germination phase, aluron layer and scutellum they undergo PC. Now, at the early stages, we can see that maternal tissues such as nucellus and perica they undergo PCD. This is to remobilize their cellular contents. They have some cellular contents. This is to remobilize this content to the, uh, nourish, uh, to, uh, for the nourishing of new tissues that are uh, differentiating. Now, which are the new tissues which are differentiating? They are the embryo or the endosperm. These are the new tissues in the seeds that are being formed. Now, during germination, when the seed is undergoing germination, endosperm also undergoes PCD. Why? Because when it undergoes PCD, it can release its starchy contents and this can be used to further nourish the embryo. Now, the living tissues that remain during germination, the living tissues which remain are the scutellum and the alveolar. These two layers, why are they still living? Because they help to mobilize the content of the endosperm. They help to mobilize the contents of the endosperm to the growing seedling. Once it has been mobilized, the aluron layer and the scutellum, they also undergo PCD. But that is after the germination, after all the content of the endosperm has been mobilized.
Now, uh, this PCD, when all the content has been mobilized, now this uh, these processes, uh, some phytohormones, some plant hormones are involved in these processes. Which are these uh, hormones? Now we all know that gibberlins or the gibberlic acid. Gibberlins, they induce the synthesis of hydrolytic enzymes. They induce the synthesis of hydrolytic enzymes in the allylone layer. In the allylone layer. Now the allylone layer, once the hydrolytic enzymes are produced, the GA then induces the allylone layer to undergo PCT. But what happens? Here comes the role of abscisic acid. Abscisic acid stops this induction. It stops the GA from inducing PCT in the allylone layer until all the endosperm, all the starch, until all the starch from the endosperm has been converted into sugars and has been remobilized. So, GA, gibberlic acid, it promotes seed germination, it promotes germination. At the same time, abscisic acid, it uh, prevents germination, it delays germination. So, abscisic acid, it delays germination until the cell is entirely matured or until all the starch has been converted into sugars from the hydrolytic enzymes of the aldehyde layer and has been remobilized. So, the correct answer here is abscisic acid. Abscisic acid, it postpones programmed cell death in the Alone layer. Next question is question one double four one. Which of the following reactions take place during the reduction phase of the Calvin Benson cycle? Now Calvin cycle comes under the dark reactions of photosynthesis. During this cycle, carbon molecules from the carbon dioxide they are fixed and ultimately they produce glucose. Now this is the Calvin cycle. Here there are three phases. First one is the carbon fixation phase. This is the carbon fixation phase. What happens here is CO2, incoming CO2 is fixed and converts ribulose bisphosphate into PGA. In Calvin cycle, PGA referred to as 3 phosphoglyceric acid. Now, the next phase is the reduction phase. This is the reduction phase. What happens here is PGA, which is formed during the carbon fixation phase, it is then converted into G3. G3P is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now this entire thing is the reduction phase. During the reduction phase, there is one transition molecule known as 1,3-BPG or 1,3-bisphosphoglyceric acid. Now during the reduction phase, 3-phosphoglyceric acid is reduced to 1,3-bisphosphoglyceric acid which is ultimately reduced to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now, among the options, we have this second one that during the reduction phase of the Calvin cycle, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which we can see here in the cycle. So this option is the correct answer. Uh, in this question, a researcher has identified a mutant plant with reduced gibberlic acid sensitivity. Now, which of the following proteins is most likely to be defective in this mutant? Now, in a plant, what does gibberlic acid do? During the gibberlic acid signaling, it inactivates DELA repressors.
these DELA repressors or DELA proteins. Otherwise, they have their first target. Their target is F. Now, PIF, these are phytochrome interacting factors. Phytochrome interacting factors, these are some factors which act at transcription levels. In plants, they have uh, they are negative regulators of light signal. Phytochrome interacting factors, they are negative regulators of light signaling in plants. Light signaling are responses or developmental responses uh, which are controlled by phytochromes. Now what does phytochrome interacting factor do? They are negative regulators of light signal. That means that when they are overexpressed. In the first case, when they are overexpressed, what happens? The seedlings in which they are overexpressed, they show scotomorphic phenotypes. Scotomorphic phenotypes are those phenotypes which can be seen in the seedling in a dark grown seedling. Scoto means dark or shaped. So these phenotypes are those phenotypes which are seen in a dark blue seedling. Now what are these phenotypes? The first phenotype is uh, that they have long hypopotiles. Their cotyledons are unopened. They are not green in color. Their chlorophyll biosynthesis is stopped. So when phytochrome interacting factors are overexpressed, they show scotomorphic phenotypes, which are long hypocotyles, unopened cotyledons, and their chlorophyll biosynthesis is stopped. Second case is in mutants. The phytochrome interacting factors do not control the development in seedlings where mutation is present in these factors. Now these seedlings, which are mutant in PIFs, they show photomorphic, photomorphogenic phenotypes. Even when they are grown in the dark, even when they are grown in the dark, they show photomorphogenic phenotypes. Now what are photomorphogenic phenotypes? As opposed to the scotomorphogenic phenotypes, they are short hypocotyles, a normal growth in seedlings, short hypocotyles, open hypo, uh, open cotyledons. and they are green seedlings. That means chlorophyll biosynthesis is present. Now during this part, I told you that GA signaling, okay, what happens during GA signaling, that gypyllic acid, it inactivates DELA repressors. What do DELA repressors do? They, are, they target the phytochrome interacting factors. Now, coming back to the question, in plants with reduced gypyllic acid sensitivity, the hormones have receptors. Hormones have receptors. Now reduced GA sensitivity, this means that the receptors do not recognize 
they no longer recognize triple acid. If they do not recognize triple acid, Tela repressors are not activated, uh, are not inactivated. Tela repressors become active. Tela repressors are activated. What would Tela repressors do? They would target phytochrome interacting factors. What they do is they either stop their binding to the DNA, they either stop their binding to the DNA or they degrade them. So what will happen in a plant which is a mutant and with reduced gypolic acid sensitivity the phytochrome interacting factors will be defective. So the answer for this question is phytochrome interacting factors or PIFs. The next question is question 1442. Which of the following parts of root is involved in perceiving gravity? Now roots in plants, they have a primary role. The first primary role is that they anchor the plant to the ground. And the second role is that they absorb minerals and water. And then conduct them upwards to the rest of the plant. Now, as shown in this diagram, there are three zones in our root. First is the zone of cell division. This zone contains cells which are actively dividing. It contains the apical nerve, the root apical nerve system. The root apical meristem gives rise to the root cap. This is the root cap. It gives rise to the root cap. And here is the crescent center. Cells of the crescent center are dormant, but they can activate, they can be activated, uh, activated now and then. Now the next zone is the zone of elongation. The cells which are produced by the apical meristem here, they are elongated here and they add to the length of the root. They add to the length of the root. These cells are elongated in the zone of elongation. The third zone is the root hair zone. In this zone, this is also known as the zone of maturation. As mature root cells are present in this zone, also in this zone are the root hair. Now this layer of root, from where the root hair are starting or where the root hair are present, this layer is known as piliferous layer. Now we talked about the crescent zone, the crescent cells of the crescent zone. Uh, cells in this part of the root, they are dormant. Now, they only get activated and they start dividing when the root cap, this root cap, when it is damaged. They divide only when the root cap is damaged. Damaged and it needs to be reconstructed. So the cells of the prison center then divide and they add to the root cap. Then root cap, what does the root cap do? The root cap is the protective layer. It protects the root apical meristem from any mechanical damage. Then as mentioned earlier, they arise from the root apical meristem. Then they help the roots, the root cap, it helps the root push through the soil. They are positively geotropic. That means it moves towards gravity, so it perceives gravity. What 
happens is that there are amyloplasts present in the root cap. The cells of the root cap contain amyloplasts. Amyloplasts are a subcategory of leukoplasts, which are non pigmented plastids. And the function is to store starch. They are mostly present in the roots or cells in the uh, underground region. They are maybe also present in potato tubers. So, what happens is these amyloplasts, they uh, in the root, in the cells of the root cap, they accumulate towards the tip of the root, towards the bottom of the cells. Now, when they accumulate, uh, they attract plant hormones such as oxygen. Towards the bottom of the root cap, yeah? these help in elongating the root towards uh, these help in elongating the root towards the ground. Helping root elongation, a growth of the root further into the ground. Now coming back to the question, which of the following parts of root is involved in perceiving gravity? Person center? No. I've already mentioned the functions of the person center. Endodermis. What does endodermis do? It is a layer of barrel shaped cells uh, which are impervious to water because they contain sumerian deposits. They are impervious to water and they function in generating root pressure in the cell, in the root. So they are not involved in perceiving gravity. Elongation zone is where the uh, newly divided cells from the root apical meristem, they are elongated. So elongation zone is the incorrect answer. The correct answer is the root cap. Root cap is involved in perceiving gravity through the amyloplasts. So the correct answer for this question is root cap. Next question is question one to go for. Muscular wills are widespread and destructive plant diseases. The symptoms of this disease are primarily caused by the clogging of which of the following. Now muscular wills. These are plant diseases which are caused by some pathogenic or disease causing fungi or bacteria. What these fungi or bacteria do, they gain entry into the xylem of the plants. Xylem is the water conducting tissue. They gain entry into the xylem of the plants and they start dividing or proliferating in the xylem. Now, as a result, what happens? The xylem gets blocked. Now, due to this blockage, it can no longer conduct water or minerals. So, it can no longer conduct water or minerals. What happens? When there is no water, when there is water shortage, the plants, they wilt. So when these plants wilt, wilting is the reduced in turbo pressure of the plant. You do loss of a large amount of water. So uh, the disease which is caused by these fungi or bacteria, which causes blockage of the xylem, is known as vascular wilt. So, xylem, the first option is the correct answer that they clog the xylem vessels. Now, what, will, what would happen if they clog the uh, phloem vessels? The phloem primarily conducts food in the plant. Wilting, whereas wilting is caused by the loss of water. So, if phloem is clogged, water would not be lost. So, this is the incorrect option. Next option is stomata. Stomata are minute pores on the surfaces of the leaves or stems. 
uh, which help in uh, transpiration and which have a role in exchange of gases during photosynthesis. Now if stomata were clogged, what would happen? They would no longer open. They would remain closed. If they were clogged, they would remain closed. As a result, there would be no transpiration or water loss. Transpiration or water loss would not happen. Since there is no water loss, the plant would not wilt. So this option is also incorrect. What are hydrothodes? Hydrothodes are uh, small pores on the margins of the leaves. There are small pores on the margins of the leaves which exude water droplets. They give out water droplets uh, due to the root pressure. If there is increased root pressure in small plants, these hydrothodes which are present, which are small pores present on the margins of the leaf, they give out water droplets. So if these hydrothodes were clogged, these water droplets would not form. The rest of the water conducting through xylem would work perfectly, would work normally. So vascular pills, as the name suggests, is dispersed by xylem vessels. So xylem vessels is the correct answer. Next question is question 1454. Which of the following plants has a biosporic, eight nucleate, bipolar embryosap development? Now this question is on plant development. Embryo sac is the female gametophyte. It is the female gametophyte in angiosperms. Embryo sac is the female gametophyte in angiosperms. And what does it contain? Embryo sac usually contains three types of cells the antipodal cells which are on the chalazal end and on the micropylar end are present synergics and an X cell these are the two synergics which surround an X cell Along with these cells, there are two nuclei suspended, which are known as polar nuclei. Now, this is what a normal embryo sac looks like. Normal means it's the most common type found in angiosperms. Around 80% angiosperms contain this normal type of embryo sac. Now different plants have different kind of developments in their embryo sac, different kind of divisions in their embryo sacs, and these are uh, categorized into 10 types. This is the embryo sac development in different types of plants, different type of embryo sac development. Now it all starts with a diploid megaspore mother cell. This is a megaspore mother cell. Now, this will further divide and it can have two phases either this or this. What is the difference between these two? Here, the cell is dividing karyokinesis followed by cytokinesis. Here what is happening? There is karyokinesis, but no cytokinesis. So first we'll follow case one. What happens once this cell is formed? It then divides further to form tetrads. But these do not look like tetrads, so what are they? 
they were tetrads, but what happened? The uppermost three cells they degenerated. And the only remaining cell was the lowermost cell. This lowermost cell was functional cell. It then again divided to form two nuclei. It further divided to form four nuclei. There is only karyokinesis taking place here. There is no cytokinesis taking place. These four nuclei further divided to form eight nuclei, a cell with eight nuclei. Now these cells, these nuclei, were later arranged and formed into cells. Here, as you can see, there is one X cell marked in red, two synergids marked in green, and three antipodals marked in pink. In the middle are two polar nuclei. So this embryosac development, which is the normal embryosac development, it is also known as polygonum. It is also known as polygonum type. You can see here that these are two cells, but they, were, they formed a tetrad, but only one functional cell was remaining. So these two types, we can call them monosporic. These two embryo sacs, these two types of embryo sacs, they developed from a single lowermost or uppermost functional cell. The first one is the polygonum type, which is the normal type of embryo sac. It is a monosporic embryo sac. It has eight nuclei and seven cells. Three cells, synergids and X cell. Three cells are antipodals and the central cell. This is the seventh cell. Now coming on to the next type. It, also, it is also monosporic embryo sac development, but with a slight um, change, with a slight difference. For the lowermost three cells, they get degenerated. And the only functional cell is the uppermost cell. Now it divides, the, cell, the nucleus divides into two. It further divides into four nuclei. And it stops at that. And these nuclei get rearranged to form the below embryo cell. In this type of embryo cell, there are no antipodals. There is one X cell, two synergids, and one polar nuclei. There are no antipodals. This type of cell, embryosac, is known as Eurothera type. Now, let's move on to the next one. This was the first, second, and now the third one. What is happening here? In the first two, uh, in the first two cells, in the first two tetrads, Three of the cells got degenerated and only one cell was functional. What is happening here? Two of the cells got degenerated and the rest of the two cells, they fused together. Now these two nuclei, they further divided to form four nuclei. These nuclei further divided to form eight nuclei. And these got rearranged just like the polygonum type. But the only difference that this is a bisporic embryo sac. This embryo sac is a bisporic embryo sac because in the first division itself there were two nuclei. Here only a single nucleus was present in the most monosporic development, but in the bisporic development there are two nuclei which were fused. The two cells were fused and two nuclei remained. This type of development is allium development, allium type. Um, I forgot to mention here, enothera type, in the enothera type, there are four nuclei and four cells. 
So it was monosporic, monosporic with four nuclei and four cells. The third one, the alien type, it was bisporic with eight nuclei and seven cells. These are the first three types. This is the case one. If there was karyokinesis followed by cytokinesis. Two types of cell development takes place in monosporic embryosac development and bisporic embryosac development. Now in case two, where karyokinesis occurs but cytokinesis doesn't. What happens here? As you can see, the first divisions, in the first division itself, each cell is four nucleate. In the first division itself, each cell has four nuclei. This kind of development is known as tetrasporin. Embryosac development. All these fall under the tetrasporic category. We look at them one by one. This is the fourth one. Now four nuclei, they further divide into eight nuclei. And it follows the normal embryosac development with one egg cell, two synergids, two polar nuclei, and three antipodals. So this is not polygonal type or the alien type. It is tetrasporic with eight nuclei and seven cells. Its name is Adoxata. The next one, the fifth one, it starts with four nuclei, a cell with four nuclei. The nuclei will divide further into eight nuclei and these eight nuclei, they again divide into 16 nuclei. So this cell with 16 nuclei, the nuclei inside, these, uh, inside the cell are arranged to form such an embryo cell. Here, there is uh, an egg cell surrounded by two synergids, but there are three sets of three antipodal cells. These are the antipodal cells. There are three sets of three antipodal cells and four nuclei, the uh, four nuclei in the center, which are known as polar nuclei. There are four polar nuclei. So how many cells, how many nuclei and how many cells are there? Three, 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 12, 13 cells. 13 cells and 16 nuclei are present in this one. It is named as Penesi type. Now let's look at the next one. Four nuclei in a cell. These nuclei divide further to form eight nuclei and these eight nuclei are arranged now. They do not divide further, they are arranged. They look like this. There is one egg cell but no synergids. There are no synergids present in this type of embryo sac. However, there are three antipodal cells but all three are not at the chalazal end. They are spread on the three uh, walls, the three ends of the the other ends of the embryo sac. There are four polar nuclei. So the total number of nuclei are eight nuclei with one, two, three, four, and the central cell with five cells. Eight nuclei with five cells. This is known as plumbago type. Plumbago type. Next one, the seventh one, again we have, we start with four nuclei, they divide further to form eight nuclei, and these nuclei divide further to form 16 nuclei, cell with 16 nuclei, which are all randomly arranged. Then further they arrange into an embryo sac, and then mature, this cell matures into an embryo sac. It forms one egg cell and one synergid. One synergid is absent here. It forms one egg cell, one synergid, and two sets of three antipodal cells. So six, seven, eight, and nine. Total nine cells. 
and 16 nuclei. This arrangement, this kind of embryo sac development is known as peperomia. I'm writing it here. Peperomia type. Now to the eighth one. Again, four nuclei, but they are kind of slightly differently arranged. One nuclei is at the upper end and three nuclei at the lower end. Now these nuclei further divide into eight nuclei and these nuclei further divide into 16 nuclei. So total number of nuclei are 16 and they are then arranged like this with one excel, two synergids and the rest of the um, how many? One, two, three, four, five. The rest of the eleven. Sorry. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Rest of the eleven cells are antibody cells. There are three sets here. The egg apparatus has three cells, two synergies, and one egg cell. So there are sixteen nuclei. 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 cells. This arrangement is known as Drusa type. Drusa. Drusa type. Now moving on to the ninth one. We have four nuclei, but three of them, they got fused together. Four nuclei, but three of them got fused together by the spindles. So spindle fusion, spindle fusion occurs here. These four nuclei, they again divide to form eight nuclei. And these nuclei are then rearranged to form this kind of an embryo sac. But there is one egg cell, one antipodal cell and one central cell. So there are three cells and eight nuclei. Three cells, eight nuclei and in the polar nuclei there is one free polar nuclei and three fused together. So this is known as plumbago type. This is known as plumbago type. Lumbago type, Embrosac development. Last one is the tenth one. And this also, the four nuclei, but three are fused at their spindles. So four nuclei, they further divide into eight nuclei. And these eight nuclei further divide into 16 nuclei. And they are then arranged such as this, Embrosac. Here there are uh, one XL surrounded by two synergids and three antibody cells which contain each of the three fused nuclei. The polar cells contain one free and three fused nuclei. So there are a total of six cells, sorry, seven cells. There are a total of seven cells and 16 nuclei. This type of embryo sac development is known as Fritillaria. Fritillaria type. Now, this is not difficult, very difficult to learn. There are three types monosporic, formed when three of the tetrads get degenerate, biosporic, when two of the tetrads get fused, and then tetrasporic, when there is cardiokinesis but no cytokinesis follows. So all these are tetros tetrasporic embryosac development. Our question is which of the following plants has a biosporic? There is only a single biosporic embryosac development which takes place here in the diagram which is that type. This is the biosporic and it is alien type. So our answer is
Next question is question 1505. Three facts are given. The first one is that chlorophyll absorbs more in the red region than in the far red region of the visible spectrum. Next is that the phytochrome photoreceptor of plants occurs in two interconvertible forms, PR and PFR, where red light converts PR to PFR and far red light converts PFR to PR. Now, phytochrome is a photoreceptor which perceives red and far red light of the visible spectrum. Uh, phytochrome is available in two forms, PR and PFR. When red light falls on PR, it gets converted into PFR. And in the same way, when far red light falls on PFR, it gets converted back into PR. So red light converts PR to PFR, far red light converts PFR to PR. Now, third one is that growing a sun plant under the canopy shed causes increased stem elongation. What is a canopy? In the forest, you might have seen that when trees are very near to each other and uh, they have a lot of branches, they usually uh, overlap each other and this is known as a canopy. On the surface of this forest, there are many plants growing. Some of them might be shade loving and uh, some of them might be sun loving. Now the surface is all covered with shade. Now what happens? The red light is mostly absorbed by plants in this region or the direct Now in a forest, there are many trees nearby each other and uh, their branches may overlap forming a canopy. The surface of the forest under this canopy is dark and uh, light does not um, penetrate this area. Little light penetrates this area. So on the surface of the forest, there may, there may be many plants growing. Some of them are shade loving, which are comfortable growing under the canopy. But some of them may be sun loving, which are not very comfortable growing under this canopy uh, or growing under shade. What happens? Uh, under sun, there is more of red light under direct sunlight. There's more of red light and uh, red light is more and less of far red light. But under this shady region, under this shady region, uh, red light is less and far red light is more. Now we know that red light converts PR into PFR. So under the shade, in the shady region, there is less red light and far red light is more. So if there is less red light, less of PR will be converted into PFR. So if there is no red light, this conversion is not possible. And since there is more of far red light, a few PFR that might have been formed, they also get converted back into PR. So as a result, the PR form is again more and PFR form is less. Now, we have to uh, see which of the following combination of statements is correct for plants growing under canopy. So here we see that red light under the canopy, which is the shady region, red light is less and far red light is more. So the ratio of red far red light must be lower. So here and uh, in the third option. So we can straight away reject these two options. So here red to far red ratio, red to far red ratio is low and here also red to far red ratio is low. Now if red light is less, there are less PFR and if far red light is more, the PFR that might be there are again converted back into PR. So there are more PR and less of FR. 
so here again the pr to f uh, pfr ratio is higher so yes and in this option it is written that pr to pfr ratio is lower so since this is not the case we can also reject this option so the correct option is answer 1 now it also states that pfr inhibits stem elongation so under this shady region if the sun loving plants sorry if the sun loving plants are growing under this shady region inside the canopy so since pfr is less they show stem elongation this is a response to the shady region since the sun loving plants they need to get out of this canopy they need to um, overgrow they need to overgrow these plants so as to uh, get direct sunlight so what they do is they elongate their stem and they allocate all their resources to this stem elongation so this is the response to shady region for shade resistance this is a shade resistance response which these plants show so since pfr here is less they show stem elongation so that means when pfr is more it will inhibit stem elongation so it has the pfr has an indirect relationship with stem elongation less of pr means the plants will undergo stem elongation more of pr means the, the stem elongation will be inhibited so this is what is means stem elongation is a response to shade which is shown by these sun loving plants which might be growing under the shade so this option the first option is correct for this question the next question is question 1524 uh, there's a table which shows photosynthetic type of plants c3 and c4 the temperature that they require and the optimum sunlight intensity levels that they require and we have to find the correct match now as we all know that c3 plants have an enzyme known as rubisco for photosynthesis and uh, c4 plants have an enzyme known as pep carboxylase the rubisco which functions at an optimum temperature of around 18 to 25 degrees celsius and pep carboxylase functions at around 30 to 40 degrees celsius so pep carboxylase needs in needs a higher temperature than rubisco so and rubisco needs a moderate temperature at low temperatures rubisco can't uh, get sufficient energy to function and at higher temperatures it gets inactivated so uh, the correct match would be that c3 plants they require moderate temperature as well as moderate sunlight intensity c4 plants they require high temperature as well as high sunlight intensity so a2 and q so the option fourth is the correct option